Hello, uh, I'm Tony Heaton, and I know you're out there somewhere as I sort of speak into the void. But thank you for inviting me to convene this event and also welcome to the first session in a series of three live events entitled Museum Collections on Prescription, Health, Wellbeing and Inclusivity. And this series is produced as a collaborative project between three professional networks, the British Art Network, the European Paintings Pre-1900 Network and Understanding British Portraits. The events are setting out to investigate the relationship between art collections, inclusivity and visitor well-being. And of course, this subject allows us to explore the intersection between art and healthcare, museum collections and representation, engagement and mental health. And these, of course, are such pertinent areas for us to understand and to respond to, and all the more pertinent, really, in these unusual times. But first, we need to look at those important housekeeping essentials. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Caroline, to explain. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, hey, Tony. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Tepegan from the Understanding British Portraits Network. So just a few notes before we kick off. We have a document of further reading and references which relates to today's session. So that will have arrived in your inboxes this morning, but we're going to post a link to the online version now and you'll find all the speaker bios at that link as well. And just so you know, after today's event, we'll be updating that document so that it reflects this afternoon's conversation. Oh, thanks a lot, Caroline. OK, I'm calling this session Nothing About Us Without Us. And it's a slogan from the history of the disability movement. And I thought it was apt for today. I've never had a hidden agenda. I love museums and I love galleries. And of course, I want to see more disabled people in them, but not just as visitors. I want to see disabled people working in the sector. And I also want to see disabled artists like me represented. And I mean, on the gallery walls. I want to see disability arts given some of the spotlight in collections and also with meaningful interpretation and proper documentation from a disability led perspective. I don't think it's difficult. NDACA, the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive, has shown the way, but it's the tip of an iceberg. There's so much more amazing work and brilliant artists out there. And in this session, I want to talk to some of those disabled artists and some curators, consultants, archivists, academics, anarchists, and sector creatives. And I wonder what they think of when they hear the title of museum collections in, uh, on prescription and the notion of health, well-being, and inclusivity. What is their experience? What would be their take on it? They often reference the social model of disability and they talk about disability arts. So before they get stuck in, I just want to share this definition with you, and it's up on screen now. So disability arts is art made by disabled practitioners, which reflects the lived experience of disability. And of course, disability arts is seriously intentioned creative work. It's often made by artists who have undertaken training in art schools or universities, or have taken PhD studies. It's, um, it's not a new genre either, and it's not to be confused with outsider arts. Though many disabled artists may very well say that they've been pushed out to the margins due to discrimination and exclusion. Disability, disability art has been around for probably over 30 years. And of course, it's still engaging disabled artists to create interesting, thought provoking and exciting work. Over the years, many disabled artists have been politicized by the social model of disability. And I'm going to summarize that just in case you're not familiar with it. OK, the social model defines disability as a social construct. It asks the question, where's the problem? And it locates it in the social organization, prejudicial attitudes and barriers in the environment, not in the individual's impairment. And the social model identifies barriers and discrimination as the major cause of disability. It was developed by disabled people. That will come as no surprise. 
and it was to identify and take action against discrimination and also to center it within an equality and human rights framework. I want to just read a quote to you. In our view, it is society which disables people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. Now, this is not a new idea. This statement that I just quoted was written in 1976, 45 years ago, as part of the constitution of UPIUS, a disability-led organization. Now, before we listen to those two roundtable discussions, I want to introduce Richard Sandell of the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester. I'm sure many of you will know Richard, and I've worked with him over the years in museums and galleries, both as an artist and as a consultant. And I know they've done some amazing leading work, radical actually, over the years. And I thought Richard would be well placed to offer some insight and would spark discussion to open our session today. So over to Richard and the film, thank you. Hello, my name is Richard Sandell. I'm co-director of the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester. Thanks for having me along to be part of your event today. In 2018, Claire Barlow, who was then curator at the Wellcome Collection, approached our Research Centre at the University of Leicester to establish a collaboration that would help to shape their new permanent gallery. Claire knew of the work we'd done in the Research Centre over a period of nearly 20 years to explore how stories of disability could be ethically researched and inclusively presented. In 2014, for example, we'd worked with Matt Fraser and a number of medical collections on Cabinet of Curiosities, How Disability Was Kept in a Box, a performance that powerfully revealed the complicity of museums in processes of othering, which have often emphasised differences at the expense of more humanising portrayals of disabled people. We subsequently worked with eight medical museums and collections across the UK and four disabled artists to engage visitors, medical professionals and the wider public around the question, why are some lives more highly valued than others? And we did this through a series of collaboratively shaped artworks that offered new narratives of disability and difference. Throughout this highly collaborative process, collections that had tended to be viewed and interpreted from the perspective of clinicians or historians of medicine were re-examined from the perspectives of artists with lived experience of disability and importantly were interpreted in ways that took account of the contemporary context within which disability rights were being negotiated and fought for. So Claire Barlow approached us with an intriguing proposition. How could the learning from these powerful but sometimes short-lived interventions be translated into a new permanent gallery at the heart of Wellcome Collection that would be in place for at least 10 years? Was it possible to radically reconfigure disabled people's relationships with the Wellcome Collection by creating a gallery that was inclusive and affirming of disabled people's lives? So we brought together a small team of disabled people, including Tony Heaton, Zoe Partington and Catherine Long, to work closely with us and with the Wellcome team. This was achieved by placing disabled people at the heart of the process, not through a one-off act of consultation, but as a sustained and meaningful dialogue in which the expertise derived from lived and learned experience of disability was as highly valued as other forms of expertise. The result is a space in which the problematic relationship between disability and medicine is critiqued through the inclusion of powerful work by disabled artists, like this video work by Catherine Araniello that uses humour to critique the ways in which disabled people are so often recipients of pity instead of respect. But more than this, it's a space that seeks to embody and convey an institutional commitment to equality that disabled people very rarely experience in the public domain. So when one of our research team, Tony Heaton, expressed his frustration at the display convention in museums and galleries, which sees benches centrally placed in front of wall mounted screens, a convention that positions wheelchair users as second class citizens who can only watch physically and symbolically from the margins, the welcome team responded by repositioning seating so that wheelchair users can occupy the prized central position, just like everyone else, and enjoy the artworks on screens alongside their non-disabled companions. 
Just as importantly, this subtle shift in design communicates something to all visitors, creating a rare example of a public space in which disabled people's rights, the right to fully access and experience culture, are taken seriously. Being Human opened in September 2019 and in its first four months was visited by over a quarter of a million people, 25% more visits year on year than its predecessor, the Medicine Now Gallery. 12% of the audience during these first months, importantly, declared themselves disabled compared with 5% average amongst benchmarked institutions. In the context of many disabled people's frustrations with the persistent neglect of their rights, with inaccessible exhibitions and excluding galleries opening every year, an article in the New York Times asked, is this the world's most accessible museum? The gallery may not be perfect, but I think it offers us an insight into how museums and galleries can be transformed when disabled people, their insights, experiences and expertise are placed centre stage. Thank you. So thank you, Richard, for getting us underway. And I want to introduce our first panel of arts and museums professionals and to welcome Zoe and David, Paulette, and Alex, and perhaps you'll introduce yourselves more fully. Zoe Partington, from wearing a black hat, I have a Frida Kahlo t-shirt on, and um, bright red hair, um, pale skin, um, and I'm here in my capacity really as a, as a disabled person, disabled professional really, that's worked in the museum and gallery sector for the last 25 to 30 years. Hello, I'm David Heavey, a white man in his 50s, uh, grey hair, and wearing a suit. Uh, I'm the CEO and Artistic Director of Shape Arts and the Project Director of NDACA. And I'm here because I've worked in culture and heritage uh, for quite a long time. Hello, I'm a white woman, 50. I, I wear glasses and I have blonde hair. Um, I'm the curator at Grundy Art Gallery in Blackpool, which is part of Blackpool Council. And I'm here because we were very lucky and excited to work with the NDACA collection in 2019. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a white man in his 50s who wears, wears glasses. I'm here because I was lucky enough to be the project project archivist and collections lead for Indaka. Watching Richard's film, uh, some of the points resonated with me. I mean, he, he talked about 25% more visitors to the welcome, 12% identified as disabled people against a 5% average. And surely that's important when we're looking to increase diversity and engagement. And he also talked about putting disabled people at the heart of the process, uh, not a one-off consultation, but sustained and meaningful dialogue where our lived and learned experiences is a really important part of the getting things right. Zoe, he, Richard mentioned you in the film. He said that you worked on being human. Uh, and I wondered if you wanted to add anything to his insights. One of the turning points at Welcome um, was Richard um, and RCMG involving, obviously, you know, yourself, myself and Catherine, um, because we were able to express our thoughts and our suggestions in a way um, that was slightly different, I think, to some of the focus of the curators and the staff. And it was received quite warmly and it was in context. And we were involved quite early at the beginning of the process, um, but maybe not early enough. And I think that's the thing that we've probably all learned over this time is to get disabled professionals or disabled experts that know their stuff in all of this um, in much earlier, because it was very, I think it was very easy for myself and Tony to notice quite quickly um, the sort of um, images that may be missing or the disabled artists that could have been put into this exhibition. But I think if we hadn't been there, lots of things may have been missed. And I think that's, you know, the really important thing is if we're not there, our voices aren't heard. Um, I was also thinking, David, that you worked on one of the projects that Richard mentioned. And also as a filmmaker, I mean, you made Disabled Century for the BBC uh, probably quite a number of years ago now. But I wonder what might have changed since then. I mean, when we made Disabled Century, which Alex and I worked on at the BBC, we had to fight and fight and fight to get disabled's point of view across. And those days they would say, oh, you need medical view, you need doctors involved, you need the whole you know, uh, paraphernalia of what they thought disability was, which was medical. And we said, no, no, disability is one thing, it's barriers. 
So we basically made the entire series with the one central question, what's the barrier? Mm -hmm. We didn't have charity in it. We didn't have medical in it. We didn't have medical model. And the BBC were very panicky, but it was a big hit because it was clearly authentic, came out of a movement and felt like it was disabled people's point of view of the world. And then in the contemporary thing, uh, the National Disability Arts Collection Archive, which you founded, Zoe was project manager on, Alex was archivist on, and I was project director on. You know, all of us know we were trying to convey the, the, the radical stories of the disability mm -hmm. arts movement mm -hmm. about barriers. Mm -hmm. So I think it has changed because people understand it's about barriers removal, yeah. but it hasn't changed that much because people yeah. are still resistant to the disabled led voice. Yeah. Alex, do you want to expand on that as the archivist of Endaka? Well, Endaka is a, a, a large, apparently from the, outs, from, the, from the exterior, conventional collection of the work by disabled artists in, working in all media, whether it be TV or film or visual arts or sculpture or even comedy and theatrical performance. But I think the single, to go back to David's point about barriers, the single thing that makes it engaging was partly is, is the fact that it's driven entirely by story and narrative. It's much easier for Endaka to, to, for people to come to Endaka with, with the idea that it's, it's stories of individual artists working within, working within almost a conventional school, a conventional artistic movement with its, with, its, with, its, with its own tradition, but one that also riffs off the formats and the conventions we expect from mainstream art, whether that be self-portraiture, political commentary, mm. uh, cultural commentary, cultural representation. Yeah, I mean, Paulette, you may want to comment on this because you were one of, you were one of the first what I might call mainstream curators to actually engage with Endaka. I started at Grundy Art Gallery in November 2017. Um, and one of the first things that I got to do as part of that uh, induction, part of the induction into the, into the role, was to visit Durham's Lumiere Festival in, um, in November 2017. And just a bit of background, Grundy, um, Grundy Art Gallery, which is part of Blackpool Council in Blackpool, obviously, um, has a strong commitment to working with artists who work with light um, and going to Durham was part of that research. So I went to a talk that was uh, convened as part of that festival and you were one of the contributors, Tony. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember that being the first time that I'd heard about the Endaka collection. The Endaka project that we did was part of a wider project across Blackpool and the Fowl Coast. Um, and that Grundy was part of a program that was funded by the Coastal Communities Fund. It's called Access Foul Coast and it was led by Disability First. So also our activity that we undertook with you was not in isolation within the town either. Mm -hmm. the, town had the town and the coast had decided to put together a funding application which was about raising the profile of Blackpool as an accessible resort and about putting some resource into training businesses and providing access audits, et cetera. So the exhibition didn't sit in isolation, which I also think was quite important um, that there was this town and region wide commitment. Did you find uh, like the welcome did that uh, it's difficult because of course with, um, with lockdown, it's difficult to know about numbers, but I just wondered if you'd you know, created more interest, more engagement, you know, from a diversity perspective as a result. I found that alongside that, we did another project um, as well. And I found that the year afterwards, we were able to note in our audience data. So we work with audience agency um, who analyze our, our data that is collected. Mm -hmm. And we did find that there'd been an increase in audiences who described and defined themselves as disabled. Yeah. So that was really encouraging to, to mm -hmm. see. That's great. I, I was conscious throughout our discussion there that pretty much everybody talked about the social model of disability. I, I gave a quick heads up at the start of this um, session about it. And I was thinking, you know, I wondered if conservative institutions still see disability within a sort of a, what we might say was an old and outdated 
and busted medical model rather than understanding it from a social model perspective of barriers and exclusion. And even the idea of well-being, you know, I'm surely well-being's for everyone. It's a given. The thing is, it's about the opportunities that these institutions are missing. So you know, I, some of my work is around opening up visual imagery to um, non-visual learners, if you like, or people mm. that can't see. Um, but it's very much about, it's about doing something differently. It's about having fun. It's about enabling new learning to take place within these cultural institutions. And I think what I've noticed delivering audio description, and I suppose in some ways it's different me delivering audio description because I am partially sighted. I'm not a sighted person, but that, that actually doesn't matter um, because there's so many ways into it, into imagery, into uh, into sculpture, into installations that you can find a connecting point. And I think the thing for me is I've really discovered working with museums and galleries, working with curators, working with the education teams, that you're not doing it for blind people. You're not doing it for those people that can't see. What you're doing is increasing your skills. What you're doing is getting so much better at observing things. Mm. And the other layer that happens is that you can become more, um, more contemporary in the way that you may share information, interpretation, all these incredible things that are within our institutions. You know, you don't necessarily have to do the old fashioned, um, you know, the idea of audio describing it and that just for one particular audience. You can use podcasts, you can use technology to do it in such enlightening new ways. And I think then it works for everyone, but you're also including all those people that miss out. So I think it's, you know, have fun with it, do it differently try it. it it can open up a whole world that you don't know about as a curator or as an educator um, or even senior staff within those institutions so it's really going on that journey it's about the journey of the institution the individuals and it's about changing the culture and that is you know the biggest issue really is to change that culture i think that idea that it's a it's a journey is absolutely crucial and i think for us at the grundy we were really really conscious that it wasn't just the start and end of something, that we did that project and that's it. So I was really mindful from the beginning that it was about creating a dialogue and an ongoing set of learning, really. I was going to say, I mean, basically for shape, you know, as we have a saying, access is growth, as Zoe just outlined there. Basically, the more you open up, the bigger the audience for everybody. Um, and I, I personally think in terms of the question, are, you know, are the organisations too conservative? Yes, they are. And, and organisations need to learn to co-create content with those who've lived the journey. Mm. Uh, and also, increasingly, collecting stories of struggle, disability movement, feminist movement, black struggle. These are the stories of the age. Uh, and, and not only because that's how social change and society gets built, because that, but it's also where the new audiences are. Mm. The digital audiences are all about agency and social change. Mm. And if you don't engage, I mean, I come from a tradition of always engaging with radical culture, but if you don't engage with what the radicals are doing, you'll miss out your own futures. I wondered, I wanted to think about, you know, local, regional, national museums, and heritage organisations. I mean, can they be authentic if they're not reflecting the lived experience of disabled people? I'm conscious of what you were saying, Paul, that, uh, um, you know, about uh, sort of broadening engagement. Yeah. And I think also something that David mentioned um, in his introduction, that idea of co-creation and co-production are absolutely fundamental, I think. Um, and that's what was so enriching about working with you and with the NDACA um, team, because I felt like I was really dis discovering and um, highlighting authentic voices. And I don't know how else we could have done that exhibition without that in, that engagement from the beginning. It, mm. it just would have been a very strange process to go through. Zoe, I just wanted to think of, you know, thinking still about that question of authenticity, if disabled people's lives and experience aren't reflected within those collections. I wouldn't, you know, on as a consultant working in the sector, you, you must see uh, you know, broad spectrum of museums at various stages of their um, evolution. There are obviously um, in contact with curators that um, that are disabled people themselves, but they probably mm. still hide it. Um, mm. You know, they and they have hidden impairments, so maybe it's slightly easier 
in that capacity, but they hide it, I think, because they're not see they're not feeling that their institutions are welcoming or open to having those mm. discussions. And I think, you know, and, and David has said this, you, you need to know about disability culture. You need to know more about the battles disabled people have been fighting for centuries. Mm. You need to know about disability art. You need to know what it means. And I think a deeper insight into reflections from disabled people about what is in your collection and what's hidden in your collection mm. And what's not in the collection is how it should all be referenced and how could speaking to disabled creative professionals open up that collection to everyone, not, not just disabled people. Mm -hmm. And it's that whole thing, isn't it, about thinking differently about disability. It can open up dialogue. I think Pauline said that in our art institutions and surroundings to highlight new forms of creativity and critique. Instead of treating disabled people just merely as a challenge and inconvenience or a legal problem for culture, we need to start from disability. It's that richness that difference and biodiversity and neurodivergence brings. It's a powerful creative tool for change. And we need to explore how valuing different ways of being in the world can offer innovative alternatives to conventional and mundane access solutions and interventions. And, you know, we talk about disability in the incredibly unique, positive, you know, way of looking at the world in a different way, the way of drawing in experiences. And yet people seem very resistant to that. And I've never, you know, non-disabled people see disability in a very negative way. You know, there's almost something primitive about that in that sort of psychology of it. But I don't know what, I don't know how we shift that. And uh, I, I was going to ask you, Alex, uh, really about, um, you know, whether curators are starting coming to you and coming to uh, NDACA and, the, you know, if a curator is, doing something around British art or the history of British culture or whatever, whether they have started to see the archive or whether it's early days yet or... The majority of inquiries that I get for people who want to access the physical archive or want more information on the digital archive mm. are from academics and curators. The Grundy was the second or third exhibition we, we, we've done. We did a, a curated exhibition at the Midlands Art Centre as well in 20 in 2020 mm. they managed to run just luck luckily managed to stop just just as covid restrictions came in so it was mm. we've done stuff at the bricks bricks and art center so i do think there's a desire and i think one of the you, you're talking about change about changing changing perceptions of conservative galleries i think one of the one of the things that's I've noticed about the uh, about some of the more informed inquiries we get from academics is that they see disability arts as, as, as a movement, an mm. artistic school, which I think is an interesting approach because it's 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 not separate from 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 disability mm. because that's obviously part of the artwork, but it's it it, it it allows people to take perhaps more a comforting conventional approach. It's, it's, it's another artistic school along with surrealism or, or impressionism or portraiture yeah. that informs, in, in, informs audiences about the human condition. It's mm. just one that, you know, for, for my money, has a much more political aspect to it. Yeah, no, I, I think you have to often march around the institutions. I mean, NDAC uh, got to six million. We were trending on Twitter, we were on the BBC and everything else. And then the organisations come to you. You have to sort of explode somewhere and they go, oh, it must be relevant. I've seen it in the papers or in the mm -hmm. press or on Twitter. So you have to kind of kind of light a flare and then they come to you. But the reason they're often resistance is there's a theory called disability dependency. People are scared, in vertical commas, of what do I have to do once I engage with disabled people in a mm -hmm. functional sense? Mm -hmm. And the social model answer is nothing. Get out of the way, give us the resources and co-create. Yeah. You yes. know, it's, it's not complicated how you support disabled mm. intervention. You co-create, you give resources and you get some get out of the way a bit. But there's some weird care and control thing that. Yeah, that's right. Through. So we're kind of, all, you know, I mean, I had to quote uh, a famous activist. They're always worried they're going to have to put me on the toilet, as she yes. said. <laughs> and I have to say to them, it's not about that. It's about power, rights, budgets, change, visibility. It's all the usual tropes of, of change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jenny Seeley, chief executive of Grey Eye, was on front row last night. Mm. And one of the things that she said is that um, it's not that hard to make things accessible and inclusive. You just have to do it. Mm. And I think, you know, that's right. It's um, just do it. Just get out there and start engaging with people. 
And one of the ways which all of all of us know is that, you know, disabled people um, have access to other disabled artists or the disabled professionals, um, people that are having these conversations all the time. So I think it is about this co-creation, how David talks about it. It's linking up, isn't it, with people that can open up networks to these institutions, these curators, these environments in new ways that actually will lead to very, very interesting outcomes. And I think it's really important to, to not avoid it, <laughs> to really you know, drill down and think, how do we make this happen? What's our steps? What's the process? Um, it is a strategy. You need a strategy to get it right. Otherwise, they're one-offs, aren't they? And, yeah. and we've seen that. You know, there's a flavor, the flavor of the month. There's certain things, certain impairment groups that institutions look at. You've got to be looking at everything, not just mm. one or two different mm. impairment groups. It's really important mm. to. And the thing is, why that then connects with the public is that many, many people have, um, you know, disabled family members, um, older people in their families. They're really aware of these issues that are happening. You know, people are having cancer treatments. They suddenly realise how inaccessible it is to get on public transport, get to the hospital, get home, get back. You know, there's no space to rest. There's no space to relax. I think it's, you know, once these things happen, people are part of it and they understand. But for some reason, and maybe it's because in our schools, it starts in our schools Disabled people are still separate, separate, separated and segregated in a way and medicalized. So everything is about not about the school environment being completely inaccessible to disabled young people. It's about the issues of that disabled person. One of the, you know, the headlines is, you know, museums collections on prescription. And there's a sense that the prescription is for us to go into the museums. And actually, while we've been talking, I think, well, as always, we've got this the wrong way around. You know, if we turn it on its head, we should be writing the prescription for the museums and galleries, shouldn't we? You know, it's the the medicine is um, is going in their direction rather than towards us. I don't know. Um, Completely, and I, I think um, it was the same when I was working at the Bartlett uh, School of Architecture. You know, it was very much about, um, you know, them making sure blind people could be architects and fit into the courses. And at some fundamental shift after about a year and a half of doing the project, I think the Bartlett realised it was their culture that needed to change, not the blind yeah. person. And it is always going back to that, really, that yeah. real fundamental issue that um, disabled people have always existed. They'll always be here. Um, we just need to make it better. We need to change things. We need to have that dialogue and the conversation and not avoid it. Well, maybe the prescription is that museums and galleries should take disabled people, you know, as employees, as consultants, as artists, artists work on the walls, you, you know, within the within the books, within the historical records. And Basically, I, I think the large institutions, if they don't change, they're, they're going to be made obsolete by progress. Mm. So they might as well align to the new forces, mm. intersectional approaches around disability in class and BAME and poverty, because out of those areas are coming the new stories. Yeah. You know, the outsider, in, in this case disabled, but you know, it could be class, it could be BAME, it could be whatever, um, has, has the new stories because they live closer to the crisis of the age. Yeah. And there's millions and millions of audiences because of digital for these new stories. Yeah. So unless organizations, you know, co-create with the lived experience of those outside, they're, they're going to become obsolete, mm. basically. So, so it's in their enlightened self-interest to open up if they want to sustain and grow. And luckily, some of the funders are now sort of nudging that towards mm. them to time to change. Mm. You know, you can't keep telling old world stories to new world audiences. And one of the things I find interesting about this debate is when I look at the stuff in, in, in Dhaka from the 1990s, it's almost as if disability arts was more visible then. And I think back to my own teenage years of, of, of doing something simple like watching TV, the personalities that I'm familiar with, whether they be, whether, whether it was Matt or, 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 or some of the disability arts musicians, they were on TV, they were visible, they were there. They had, they had there, was, there was definitely a moment in the 1990s probably because of where the rights movement was at the, at the moment. So I don't think these mm. things are necessarily linear. Mm. I think you just have to, in large institutions 
have to keep have to keep on have to keep on keeping on you it's not something you do it's not a box you tick mm. it's so it's an it's an ongoing process and i was just going to add to that alex actually that it's also about ensuring that those collections are constantly being added to i think we've mentioned that before but it's about having that longer term legacy i think is really important and that's something that we're committing to as well and, and that's a really important point for me because, you know, when I was um, chief executive shape, I was constantly pressing, you know, the um, the British Council or the Arts Council or the big institutions, you know, why have you not acquired work by disabled artists? You know, there are powerful works out there and yet you shun them and you can't give me a really good reason why you haven't got work in the collection. You know? Well, I I, well, without naming the very, very large UK organisation with whom I had a row, as the current CEO of Shape, that's precisely what came up. We had this uh, large organisation say they wanted to buy uh, some art from one of our shows, but the work wasn't good enough. And I was really angry. I said, how would you know? How do you know the coming zeitgeist? How do you know the new aesthetic forms? How do you know the new witnessing? You don't you've got no idea you know this is the same thing where, where you know Manet disrupted the, the you know the um uh schools of thought but came around with perspective the salon de refuse was born out of that because the salon wouldn't take it so it's always been the way with creative innovation that the current gatekeepers just don't know some of the some of the time and they need to open up and co-create the new discourses with us basically as disabled people um there are other things going on that exhaust you, that give you less time to have these conversations and these dialogues with the cultural institutions. Mm. And like you say, you know, we have these conversations with Arts Council, with British Council about representation within their own collections, and not just representation, about why they don't have audio description of every item in their collection organised mm. and in, in, a, in a way shown as good practice to every other institution. Mm. And the thing is, you you know, we've all been having these conversations individually with these organisations, and I haven't seen much change. And I feel, you, you, in the end, you just, you just, it's not that you, you give up, but it is, that's absolutely exhausting, isn't it? And you just think, where, you know, how do we move these things forward if these people are not going to listen? Yeah. And they do listen when non-disabled people tell them this thing needs to happen. Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing I've observed over 30 yeah. years, and I yeah. still frustrates the hell out of me, if I'm honest. Yeah. We often come out of places thinking we took two steps forward and one step backwards. And uh, I'm, I'm always conscious that that's in my mind. And I think Alex's point is absolutely true. I think there was more visibility at the time. And I wonder how we, you know, light that fire of, uh, Again, and maybe we do that by much more co-creation and more engagement. But I think we're open to that. I think the the challenge, you know, the prescription we throw out to the institutions is, well, we're, we're engaged in it. Why aren't you, you know, what do we have to do to encourage you in to take the medicine? Yeah. And nothing about us without us. Disability, inclusivity and engagement explores the intersection between heritage collections, disability and well-being. For example, are disabled makers and visitors reflected in public collections and their programming? Do disabled artists have a voice at the top table? Are sector professionals responsive to the well-being of disabled people? The slogan, nothing about us without us, appears on t-shirts and banners within the collection of Endaka, the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive. The slogan was used in the early 1990s by disabled activists who protested at uh, lack of rights and inclusion into civic society. And even now decisions are made on behalf of disabled people rather than by disabled people. And I've invited a selection of disabled artists and curators to discuss this. Uh, Chris? Christopher Samuel. Yeah. Um, I make art about disability politics. I'm a black male. <laughs> um, wearing see through framed glasses with a yellow hoodie. So, yeah. I'm Tanya. 
and um, I'm a, a middle-aged white woman with the short Mohican haircut and I've got a black t-shirt on and I'm sitting in uh, my home studio surrounded by many paintings. I'm Aidan Mosby, I'm a middle-aged, particularly pale white man wearing glasses, a dark top and a woolly hat. I'm Aminda, um, I'm a disabled neurodivergent, uh, chronically ill uh, brown woman with long black curly hair, um, crutches in the background. I'm Sonia Bua and um, I'm a neurodivergent artist and a writer and a consultant and I'm a middle-aged white woman with shortly cropped hair um, wearing um, black headphones and um, a black top with a black and white necklace. I thought we might open up with the fact that there have been apparently any number of collections focused arts, health and wellbeing programmes over the years. And alongside our work as artists and the genre of disability arts, which has been around for over 30 years, and issues like the ones in this title are actually reflected in the content of often very powerful works of art by disabled creatives, certainly over the last 30 years. So it would seem that there would have been many opportunities for collaboration between disabled artists, their work and institutions. I wonder if you can think of any, or if you can rem you know, remind us of any examples. I remember uh, it, uh, my very first um, project in Leeds City Art Gallery, which was kind of um, you know, e evolutionary at the time. And um, it, was, it, it was disability led, it was political, it was put, putting disabled artists and disabled people at the forefront, but we kind of ended up in the in the education room. And I think, and I think for many many years, you, you, that's the place where disability arts and disability arts projects have kind of led from. I remember many years ago somebody saying that disability arts has been appropriated to teach non-disabled people about disability rather than it being about art. I think it's very telling that you can be doing cutting edge innovative work that's about you know disabled leadership and leading with creative practice and really making a, you know positive change and um, very sadly it's not it's not being recognized for what it is. I, I think that the, 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 when I have got to the top table, it's been through kind of coincidence, through the coincidence of shape, you, you, you know, Tony meeting, you, you know, the director of the National Portrait Gallery on the street and saying, can you come and open this show of this, this fantastic woman's portraits? You know, and that kind of leads to a, you know, a few years down the line to, uh, OK, I've created another project, but I want it to be in the National Portrait Gallery. Mm -hmm. And I request a conversation and I get that conversation but uh, would I have got that conversation if that incidental meeting and that incidental introduction to my work had not been through Tony meeting um, Sandy Nairn on the street corner. I think there are also a lot of um, unconscious bias as well when it comes to what certain programs or curators of programs believe disability looks like. Everyone's intersectional, no one's a single identity. And I've been ignored for about 15 years. I've been working in the arts. It's only recently that I've been no, um, somewhat noticed. And I know that that's to do with the fact that I'm, I'm also a brown woman. Um, I've also got an ethnic name um, that I'm not, that I also come from poverty, that I, I do not have the finance to get me to these meetings at times or, um, and that can be really difficult because a lot of the time when, you, when you're in a, a, in a space for disability, it's, it's an idea someone has in their head of what they want and they're just waiting for the person to say it. So um, that person can be given um, 
I don't know, almost the title of, of given, of providing a new movement or, or criteria for a program. Um, and it's something that they've already thought about <clears throat> and they just want to give it an image, I guess. Um, and it, it never seems to be um, a disabled brown or black person, um, which I find really difficult. Um, and as a result has excluded me from so much. I think what we're talking about is agency. I think that as disabled people, we are, we are diminished in society and we don't have a, we generally don't have a societal value. And I think culturally we have very little cultural value. We're invited along but we're very rarely given the agency or allowed to exert our own agency in order to run these projects in mainstream institutions and organizations. And you know, we're, we're very rarely given the opportunity to, to co-design or co-run, let alone run by ourselves. It's like, it's very much like the charity model. It's like we're invited in and allowed to do stuff by others the gatekeepers very firmly keep us out until like Aminda says you know one of us matches their agenda which they want a spokesperson for in order to validate their own idea mm. and you know in as much as that we don't have agency within the cultural sector it's even those kind of like I'd go so far as to say sometimes we're infantilized mm. in the fact that we have to I don't know, to, sometimes to get access to the accessible toilet, we need to go and ask for a key. It's like needing permission to go to the toilet. Yeah. It's like rather than exerting our adult agency in order to be like, you know, to look after ourselves. Yeah. It, it made me think that if our work is not held in those institutions, you know, and, and curators and decision makers don't come out of their institutions to look at our work, how are we ever going to get beyond that impasse? I was just reminded of a piece of work that I created and just reflecting back on it. If the media never picked up the work, I would have been kind of lost. And I say that because I say they would pay attention now because it's in the mainstream. Uh, it's, it's given a kind of validation in that sense. Otherwise, it would have been kind of lost. And there's a lot, I think, um, I'm reminded as well, there's where the critics writing about um, artwork by disabled people. Um, the survey done by Art Council England that the report came out at the end of, at the beginning of um, last year, 2020, and showed the state of representation of different, you know, different minorities or, you know, sect, diff yeah, different minorities, different identities within, within organizations. And, you know, there's 20% disabled people in the UK or in England. And it's like, when you're getting zero people identifying as being disabled within arts organizations, how can we expect to be represented? It's like, they aren't representative of us. We're not going to see, we're not valued societally, culturally. Why are they going to put us into a mainstream gallery when none of the, or very few of the people who work in those organizations or who curate, you know, actually even come into contact or think about um, disability or other, you know, or other populations? I think that, um... It's a slight shift, but I think uh, it, it's going in cycles right now. It's quite trendy. Um, um, and everyone seems to be on that bandwagon. Uh, but I don't know. It still seems very separate, um, like a more box ticking exercise. I, I think every time you go into, a, you know, into a, an institution, if you like, you know, a big art, especially in visual arts institutions, you know, they, you, you're like, again, you're kind of teaching them 
all about the, the you know the history of disability art the history of the disability movement right you know right from stage one and you know if only you know they had some sort of reference if they sort of like you know once you'd educated them in that area then why why is that not kind of and then embedded in the culture of that institution yeah and it's very interesting that after having um, had the um, exhibition from the Andaka collection come to um, uh, the, uh, the um, Birmingham um, Art uh, uh, Mac in the in Birmingham. Um, very interesting. There was an intern who was based at uh, BMAG, that's Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, and they came to see that exhibition and uh, saw my work, and and then uh, asked me if I'd ever thought of having one of my paintings in the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery collection. And only now as have they now decided to take one of the portraits, which was created in the, um, in the Portraits and Told collection. And this portrait is of John Confra, um, who's a black um, artist. And he'd done a lot of work around um, black politics in in Birmingham and um, and they've decided to now take that painting into their collection I mean I mean how many years have I, have I been creating these paintings and this is the first one that's going into a national collection which is that, not disability led that brings me to ask you if you as artists feel represented in collections then do you see yourselves reflected on the walls of galleries or in the stories, in the interpretation? I've had some sort of um, experiences where I feel I do recognise neurodivergent creative practice in some quite significant artists who are no longer with us. Um, and I'll give Agnes Martin mm. as, a, as an example of that. And going round and seeing her massive retrospective exhibition, I think it was at Tate Modern, a few years back and having an almost religious experience in front of these paintings and feeling this is something I recognize and then you know I'm not allowed to say so because it's stigmatizing of the dead artist mm -hmm. and um, while I understand that I also think yes but that is stigmatizing of me if I'm not allowed to say that this person may have been autistic um, and, you know, it was uncanny for me because I then went and looked at her life story and realised that she had a lot of the hallmarks of somebody who may well have been autistic. So what I was doing was, you know, actually recognising something in the work. But it's not, you know, it's not part of the narrative, obviously, because this person is no longer with us. But it shouldn't be censored to say, I recognise this. We are, other lives and our lived experiences are not taken seriously as subjects. And when we work with our lived experiences as subjects, it is medicalized or it is infantilized or it is uh, labeled othered. Yeah. Whereas I think able-bodied artists, uh, non-neurodivergent artists, lived experience is considered art mm. and perfectly worthy subject matter. Yes, And I, I find all of that hugely problematic. I've just been on the, the Tate website and they've they've recently changed the uh, their search methods so I, you can't just put in disability but they do have a little you can um, click onto disability and arts box and then you've got an image of 12 disabled artists in there because I, I used to do this thing called disability versus dogs where I would go to the, the Tate search engine and put in the term disability and you might get, you know, 170 or so results. And then I would put in a random search term like dogs or windows or rain. And then, you know, more often than not, the other search term, you'd get hundreds back, you know, and it's just, it's just the lack of representation and the lack of thought and the, the lack of presence of, of disability. And then even it's the rep it's the reappropriation of, of certain disabled artists like Frida Kahlo, for instance, who was clearly a disabled artist, 
but it's been she's been reappropriated by the mainstream and you know it, within concert institutions it's very rare that um you know that she's classified as a as a disabled artist yeah um frida carlo is probably the one artist when I was really young that I identified with. I had the same spinal operation um, and as a woman of color as well. Um, yeah, she was the first artist that I saw something similar in, um, but still not a full representation because uh, I think a recent exhibition in the V&A was mainly to do with her fashion um, and even her braces as fashion, not as um, a part of her disability. And it seems that when her disability is spoken about, it's for passive inspiration, a way to um, activate able-bodied artists um, and, and remind them that their lives aren't that bad, <laughs> in, a, in a way. Um, and I think that's what a lot of the conservative um, idea of disability in arts is, is either medicalized or it's this passive um, inspiration porn um, idea about disability or it's a uh, part of therapy. I've never seen female um, visibly disabled artists that are being shown in a beautiful manner. Mm -hmm. Um, and how our skills as disabled people are incredible and vast. We, we world the world around us constantly and none of these skills are, are shown in the work. And if we do, those works are not deemed as a part of art. We have to remember this kind of couple hundred years of certain type of art, male able-bodied art history we're dealing with. So it's a back catalogue and an ingrained mindset we're up against. So mm. I'm not really surprised at how slow or where we're, where we're at. I think um, a lot of institutions that either try to fit in with um, the ruling social norm or reflect their, their kind of culture landscape um, or, or it's the complete opposite. So it's the, con it's the continuation of the sort of white European canon yeah. that, that sort of, that comes out of those learning institutions I get, and gets replicated. It's an inability to see outside a very narrow band of cultural references mm. which just don't encompass the vast range of human experience. They make themselves irrelevant to us if they're not mm. able to open the doors of perception. In some ways you've got to feel sorry for people. I'm not sorry for them because they're the power holders but mm. in some ways you've got to feel how dull and boring is that if, if, yeah. if the offer is so uniform. Yeah. I think it's about risk, they, they, you know, they just, they, they see it as a risk, they risk, they have to take risks, we are risk takers, we are risk doers, yeah. and, and this is what we spend our life doing, yeah. never mind yeah. the art, it, you know, we do it as part of our everyday life. You know, the pandemic has created a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential to take things digitally, mm. and, you know, a lot of that is being driven by the ableist normative you know, population who, who you know, and it's it's up to them. Again, they're exerting their agency. We've been wanting digital meetings for years, you know, um, but now it's it's uh, expedient for the normal of population. But I wonder, it's I think we're we I run a risk of transferring the ableism of the physical world into the ableism of the digital world. I went to a um, a webinar last week which the title was around diversity, access and inclusion. And there wasn't, a, there wasn't a sign interpreter, there wasn't closed captions. It's like there was no access provision. And yet 
the, the theme of the event was access, inclusion, and diversity. <laughs> and I, you, you couldn't make you couldn't make it up. But then also, you know, mainstream galleries are trying to have an appeal and then they'll put their exhibitions into a digital format. But that digital format, you know, they're pretending, they're just trying to replicate the gallery. And yet you get into the gallery and you're clicking and there's no access provision within that digital gallery at all. We've only been talking about access for about 35 years though, haven't we? We so, have, and we'll be talking about it for the next 35. Yeah, Chris, you were gonna say something. I think because, because people don't experience something, disability, it's not in their radar. And as soon as something direct, directly affects someone, then, then people pay attention. Yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of people with um, <clears throat> invisible disabilities that don't um, identify as disabled for this stigma. Mm. Um, and in fact, there may be in, um, in organisations a large amount of people with um, mental health concerns or uh, neurodivergence and so on, but just they adhere to the ableism themselves that, um, yeah, they don't want to identify it as, and that is also preventing any movement. I work with neurodivergence very openly in the arts, and I can tell you that the, the figures in the arts um, for neurodivergence alone is, you know, people just haven't got a clue. This is actually, you know, going to come once we do know it's going to be a very high percentage of people. And I do think within organisations, there will doubtless be, you know, some of these institutions, they've only got to look within to find, um, you know, individuals who might have the knowledge to help them move forward. Um, they've just got to make the conditions for being able to declare disability more equitable and less stigmatising. Uh, you know, people fear for their jobs, they fear for all kinds of reasons not to come forward and declare disability. As somebody who's, a, you know, who's visibly disabled, you don't always want to be that, you, you, you know, that person as well, you, you, you know, sometimes you want to just be that, you know, I'm just, I'm just a painter, yep. I'm just, I'm just a woman, yes. I'm just a wife, <laughs> a mother, a daughter, a sister. You know, I don't always want to be that, like, you know. <laughs> Constantly on duty, aren't we? I know, yeah. I think that, that really brings out something I did want to say, um, which is that I didn't choose to be an advocate. I didn't choose to be a consultant to arts organisation. I'd much rather just be an artist. Yes. Um, but I'm forced into this situation. I'm you know, in an ableist society, you know, ableism has to really kind of, I have to think about that because you, you know we don't we're not always that that person that that part of our identity is not always at the forefront. But there's there's that expectation that we do that emotional labour that we are constantly on, and yet we aren't on the clock. You know, it's expected that we provide these insights of our lived experience, but that we're not. But it's not valued economically. It's like, whereas like, you know, organizations pay hundreds of pounds to get consultants in, if not thousands, but we're expected just to impart our knowledge and experience freely and be grateful for the opportunity. And I think things are changing ever so slowly. And I mean, there's still a lot to be done and there's a lot that isn't changing, but I've been part, or I'm being part of a, um, a project with Dash, Disability Arts Shropshire and MEMA to who, so I've been a disabled curator associate at, at MEMA for the, for the last year, um, you know, and that's not a tick box exercise. That's about properly embedding into the organization and having proper two-way learning. Yes, I've benefited and learned about, you know, collections and exhibition making and stuff within an institution, but also that exchange of, of kind of impacting on how that organization um, you know how it how it treats other people, how it includes, how it how it's working towards increased accessibility, um, 
you know, and really thinking about the practices right from, you know, from the audience to the artists, to the people who work there, to the visitors. And yeah, that's one institution. And there's another cohort coming in the next year. But thing, you know, and it's great that things are, ch are changing and I'm grateful for that experience. But, you know, we need far more like that. We need far more disabled curators who, you know, who are curating for, for you know, for, for, a, for a non normative kind of audience. Mm -hmm. But just because it's non normative, you know, just because you're choosing non normative exhibition subject matters doesn't mean to say that it's irrelevant to, to a normative population. Well, we've heard the views and thoughts from Richard at ICMG, and we've had a round table of arts professionals and a round table of artists and curators. And they're all here now live and looking lively actually and ready to answer questions and share their thoughts. And uh, I hope the session has provoked some thinking and questions. Um, uh, but we're now gonna take a 20 minute break and hope you will return relieved and refreshed uh, to join us in a moderated Q and A. And we've had some questions in so we, we can get started in 20 minutes. Um, um, maybe we need to think about how we move from talking about it to solutions and actually doing something about it. But the questions are up to you. So whatever time it says on your clock now, we'll be back in 20 minutes. OK, see you in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, welcome back. I um, We've had some great questions, actually. So I think rather than give some great help, everybody's woken up and got back and got coffee, I'd rather just get straight back into the questions. And uh, I noticed there's a couple of people just need to click in. But um, I think the first, the question that I thought I want to throw out, because it's quite, it's a generalist question in some ways, but, um, it's uh, and it might come to you, Sonia, uh, um, and you you might kick it on to somebody else. But it basically, it's a, it's, a, it's about it's a confusion between the idea of Frida Kahlo or Agnes Martin. You know, are the artists saying that they should be noted as being disabled by galleries? Because maybe early in the conversation, the speaker said that they wanted to be recognised and represented 
but not highlighted as being disabled. So I guess it's a bit of either a paradox or a confusion. And, and I think there's probably a number of people might want to have a crack at that. So um, if you can keep it snappy and, and give, us a, give us a shout at it and see how you get on. I hope you get the gist of the question. Microphone. Is your mic on, Sonia? I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Have you got, oh yeah, you might be on now. Your volume. Fire, <laughs> fire away. I'll come back to you when you've sorted your, I'll come back to you when you've sorted your uh, sound system out or uh, the guys will sort it out for you. I think, were you, Tanya, did you want to have a crack at that? Um, oh. That's oh, a no. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Barry? Well, um, just give me the question quickly again, Tony, because I just got lost in, the, in all of that a minute. Oh, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, have a think about it. And I'm not sure, Aidan, did you want to have a crack at it? Yeah, I can uh, <laughs> take a crack at it. Though I can't. No, I'll have a crack at it if you, you know, if no I, can't, has I can't speak for anybody else, but I think, I think there's a difference between. Um, having the disability of artists, with, which are shown regularly in established galleries and you know other places where we see art, and having those kind of it clear, like you know, for instance, Frida Kahlo, who was clearly disabled, but not necessarily being described as being disabled. Yes. But also, it's about our representation as disabled artists, and it's acknowledging, you know. I don't want to dis deny that I'm disabled, but, but I, nor do I want it to hinder my representation or sh having been shown in a gallery. And it's like, I, I want my work to be, you know, seen and me to be seen on the quality of my work, regardless of, you know, my disability. It's like saying, are we going to judge people with glasses differently? And everybody who makes work with glasses is going can only identify as being glasses wearers and are going to be in the glasses gallery. It's yeah. like I think it's it's owning our owning our identity and having that valued mm. rather than diminished. I think I think what I'd say when I put my artist hat on is that I can't escape. You know, I'm a very obviously disabled person, I'm a wheelchair user, so I can't escape for that. But actually, all my interventions with people outside in the world, they make judgments about me as a wheelchair user, and so a lot of the work that I do is concerned with my interaction with the world and interaction with people. So disability is part of that interaction. So obviously it's gonna come up. Um, and and I, want to, I want that dialogue to be part of my work, but uh, I make work that's got nothing to do with my impairment. And obviously that's, that then gets critiqued in a different way, I suppose. Well, I, I mean, free I think it, you know, Frida Kahlo. You know, she was she was a disabled person. You know, she had, you know, she had um, mm. interventions. She made work, you know, from a disability perspective, yeah. from and a lived ex it. from a lived experience. Uh, you know, that was very much forefront of her work. It's yeah. only because of the of the of the time of when and when she lived you know it wasn't recognized as that mm. but in a contemporary world we recognize that and yeah. so why can't we have that 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 dialogue within yeah. that collection yeah i think it's a really difficult question as it relates to um, autonomy and self-identification mm. and doing one or the other is more gatekeeping that we don't really need mm. um I do think that Frida Kahlo, if identified as disabled during her active years, that would have paved the way for disabled women of colour, especially as an artist, she spoke about her relationships, her marriage, sex life, sexuality, quite a lot. That mm. would have been really powerful as a disabled person, specifically because we're, all, we're always viewed as asexual mm. and incapable as having relationships. Mm. Um, and I do feel that if she was, maybe I would have felt more representation. Yeah, it's very complicated, isn't it? And when we look back in history, I know, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I've spoke to people about this and it, it, it is complicated. And sometimes people do say, well, it would be a barrier to my career. I just don't want to go down that road. 
at all. I think some of us who do go down that road, it's because um, we, we the, the work speaks about it. So you can't kind of have to go down that road. It's almost like a, a point of activism rather than a career decision. I, I think what I think. I think when I'm when I'm a dead painter, I will <laughs> I will certainly want to be re 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 known, you know, in in the wider world, you know, as a, as a disabled artist. And I just really feel that if if we don't tackle this, you know, within within collections at this point, mm. when, when I'm when I die, and, and my my paintings are out there. Yeah, that that dialogue will not will be missing, and I don't yeah. want that to happen. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move us on, um, unless anybody's you know desperate to get in because we have got a lot of questions and there's some really good ones in here, and I want to um, I, I want to uh, talk about um, so you're a, you're an artist, you're disabled. Have you found that galleries and institutions expect your work to be about your disability? And if so, why do you think that is? So I don't know who, who might want to crack at that. If nobody comes in, I'll have a crack at it. I think there's a, uh, oh, sorry, Sonia, you go. Can you hear me this time? Yeah, yeah sure. Oh, so. brilliant. Okay. Um, sorry, Aidan. Um, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's really complex. So, um, for a long time, I haven't made work about my disability. I mean, I've only discovered that I have a disability, an invisible disability, um, five years ago. So I'm relatively new to all of this. But my current work is about my disability, and my neurodivergence. Um, so I haven't really encountered that expectation, but uh, from from external kind of you know perceptions and and um, ideas about what I should be doing with my work. Mm. But there is a kind of dialogue that goes on, I think, in a moment where the lived experience comes through. And that is, you know, that's that's kind of what you have to do. So I think I'm sort of still hanging over from the previous question and bringing it forward. But it's it is it's about conversation that you're having with the people who you're hoping to exhibit your work with and, and the audiences you're hoping to reach mm. and all of that. And I think it's like there's a category for you if you're making work about your disability, but there isn't a category. There isn't a clear path for you if you're not making work about your disability. And I have heard a lot of artists say that they don't know where they fit within that schema and it is confusing and complicated. And I think it's a very nuanced and individual, um, you know, kind of path that we have to tread just I think this the, the two questions to me the two last questions feel like they're, they're very related in a way yes yeah and I, I also when I uh, thought about this I thought well if your work is overtly about disability issues and the gallery or the institution are going well we don't really want to go anywhere near that it, I think it's very difficult for them to unpick a way through your work to say well the work's good and it may there will well be you know subject matter in this, but we don't really want to go down that down that path. So it it, it, it kind of pushes you off, it pushes you out of their uh, vision, so to speak. Aidan. Yeah, I think I think there's an assumption in the question that, and that part of it is why we're here. There's an assumption in the question that actually galleries are interested in what we're doing and want to put us into their galleries. I think part of the problem is that we aren't in the galleries and that we aren't represented. And, you know, and, but I also know that when I show work in a clearly a disabled context within, within a disabled or disability context within a building and within a, the work that I show, it's valued or viewed and critiqued in a totally different way as to the work that I put into like a, a mainstream gallery or institution and that it is viewed totally differently but that's about the mm -hmm. the value that society and the art world puts on disability and disabled people yeah it's almost like let's get in the gallery first and then we can have that discussion isn't it you know we're not we're, we're completely under the radar you know get the work up on the walls and let other people discuss that really let critics have a look at it and you know let's start a dialogue going we're okay for the corridor down to the toilets but not for it the is. main gallery 
Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think it's interesting because it, it it is all about the lived experience, isn't it? And what's legitimate. And people who don't have a disability, who aren't disabled, don't have to have this conversation, don't have to have this whole negotiation about what is appropriate, where do I put it, you know, who wants to see it, who, you know, what do I do if people want me to do something I don't feel comfortable with, but they're offering me an opportunity. Yes. And also this idea of exposing yourself and exposing your lived experience. Maybe you don't want to do that, but maybe that's what's on offer. But, uh, it's but that's very the, difficult. That, that's the discussion with the curator, isn't it? To sort of figure out what, what the nature of the work's going to be like when it's presented, you know, in, in, in the gallery. I'm going to move us on to a, another question. I might come back uh, uh, to you, but I thought I thought you'd want to have a crack at this one. And it's about thinking about how non-disabled artists have appropriated disability to add value to the work. So it's almost like the opposite side of this. And, and it's sort of the question says in 2001, when the artist had an opportunity to make work about their lived experience of prosthetics. And then the, the mainstream burst with Mark Quinn and his sculptures of people with limb difference, uh, Alison Lapper on the fourth plinth, uh, but also lots of um, people with limb difference. And then it, it felt okay. But the artists were saying, well, you know, it felt to me like Mark Quinn had stolen the opportunity out from under uh, disabled people, you know, our agenda, so to speak. Uh, um, and I wondered if people have got a point of view on that, uh, you know, whether um, whether curators need to select both disabled and non-disabled artists to exhibit together in that, those sort of high profile exhibitions, whether that would have been better if Mark Quinn's work would have been exhibiting alongside other artists who, who have the lived experience unlike Mark Quinn. I don't know whether anybody wants to sort of unpick some of that. Tony? Yeah, Zoe. <laughs> I think um, it also relates to the other question as well that we just talked about. Yes. What, one, of the issue, one of the very fundamental issues is that, you know, disability arts started because we were excluded from the mainstream. So yes. it's that outside having a discussion, creating work, and maybe people coming to us as opposed to fitting in the other way around. So I think that's quite important. And the other thing is about... Um, this whole idea of, um, well, it is, it's the fitting in, isn't it? This is the issue because in our schools, and I know what's going on about education, in our universities, in our art schools, and for curators and in the galleries, and this is why NDAC is really important. People aren't taught about disability art and all these questions and things that we're discussing so that they don't actually have this um, background about, oh, there's a disabled artist I'll go and talk to because the work that they're discussing around female solidarity is really relevant in a disability context, but also from a female perspective. And it's, you know, it's so it's missing fundamentally from everybody's journeys through education from the very beginning. And, and that's another area that we need to really mm. uh, build on and put it in, really. Mm. Yes. I mean, it fits in nicely with the, the next question that I, I sort of, again, this comes up quite a lot, but it's often about what can and we can't do as an organisation comes down to budgets. And it relates to the um, to, to the front row question that, uh, 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 that you talked about in the film. But it says, uh, unfortunately, making our exhibitions and displays more accessible and inclusive isn't possible because of funding budget allocations. Do you have any advice on how curators tackle this issue, particularly with museum management? I mean, I know what I'd say, but uh, I'll let you I'll let you pick it up if anybody wants to. If you don't, I'll certainly pick it up. Well, again, sorry. Um, it, it's very hard, isn't it? Because senior people are making these strategy decisions when they're putting the budgets and the accounts together. Um, when I was working in Brazil with um, fantastic arts organizations and institutions. Um, the legal team were in charge of some of these budget issues and they began to understand that, you know, any artist producing work needed to think about these equality issues and they built it into the contracts and the development. So it became embedded as, 
you know, if you like, um, in the DNA of the organisation. So it's always there. At the moment, it's still separated, isn't it? It's not really embedded. So people spend money on printing or digital interventions or social media, but it could be part and parcel of all of that. It doesn't have to be separate, but it has to be recognised mm -hmm. as being there all the time. And I think with the Welcome, um, you know, with the Welcome Trust, they began to understand you don't just have one accessibility person working within your organization. It has to filter across the entire organization. So that if an education team or a curator is putting an exhibition together, the funding is there to build these things in because other people have helped that happen. So it's we've got to work in teams. We've got to work collaboratively, really. And I also think, so just to say, so I think it, it also, you ha it has to be there from the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's not something that you think about at the end when you're working out what large print you need, or it just needs to be part of the thinking. So for me, it needs to be as fundamental as other things in those budgets. You know, it has to be listed, it has to be highlighted, and it has to be included from the beginning. Mm. Again, I, th I think from, from a disability-led perspective, you know, every project that I, you know, that I create comes from an accessibility point of view right from the beginning, because mm. fundamentally, how can I make work? How can I have people see that work? How can I do anything with that work if if access is not part of the beginning yeah. story? It's part of our I think, sorry. Well. sorry, Aidan. Yeah, I just want to... Um, I mean, absolutely, the, um, the budget should be there when the exhibition is being planned and not an add-on. Yeah. But also, you know, as a disabled curator, it's like, I think, you know, I curate with access, like everybody's saying, from the beginning. But some of the access solutions don't cost anything or don't cost a lot of money. You can get really big wins for you know, for next to no money. It doesn't cost very much to move plinths to a distance where you could get a wheelchair through. That's totally free. It's just about looking at things differently or putting a seat in a different place like we saw in the film. Yeah. And, you know, and you don't need a fancy app. You can record like an audio tour and have a download file on your website with the exhibition. And again, that costs the time that it takes to, to talk into the you know, it's it's really cheap, adaptive wins. We don't need the, all these all singing and all dancing solutions. It's like very basic. It's often the best. It's just thinking and seeing differently. Yeah, I think, you know, funders have a part to play here as well, don't they? I mean, if they insisted that access was part of a funding agreement to fund a, an exhibition, then it would have to happen. And also, if disabled people were employed in the institution, they would have a something to say about it. And of course, I'd always say to um, museum management that if you've got an equal, you know, an equality statement, so you talk about working within the social model of disability, then you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And, uh, you know, and the bottom line is that um, there's a, something called the Equality Act 2010, and you've got to make reasonable adjustments within the act. So I don't think there's a get out clause for not providing access. And, and on top of that, Tony, I don't think it's a, 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 a one or the other sort of situation. It's Sorry. also, um, you know, it's also a human rights uh, and a justice thing, you know, yeah. in the Human Rights Declaration, I think it's Article 27, to say everybody's got a right to a cultural life. If yes. we're excluded from those cultural citadels, then we aren't, and it's a human rights issue. Yeah. And a question asked about sort of invisible impairments and how why people didn't feel confident to mention that and I wondered if anybody wanted to pick up that I know it was uh, the question was around dyslexia and I remember many years ago the uh, the students at the RCA 70 percent of art students identified as being dyslexic uh, which is a you know a big number but I don't know whether anybody wants to comment on that idea of feeling unable to come out around uh, invisible impairments. I, I can certainly speak to that. Um, yeah, thanks, if, Sonia. If that's Sorry. okay. Um, yeah. I don't really, I mean, I am dyslexic amongst other things. I don't really know about the difficulty of um, declaring dyslexia so much. Um, I can speak from an autistic perspective more 
and the extraordinary stigma that exists around autism and, and many other neurodivergences. And, um, you know, I've encountered um, creatives who've wanted to um, work with their neurodivergence openly and have just found it too difficult and have had to make a decision to change the subject matter of their work because they just can't deal with the stigma and the, the difficulties around the way that you are perceived once people think that you have you know, a particular neurodivergence. So I think that's what has to change. And the more of us that can be out uh, and being out is actually a very privileged position. I think a lot of people don't realize uh, how difficult it can be and that that is a privilege. Uh, mm. But it but it really is. And I think, you know, even I've been shocked sometimes by uh, working with artists who, as I say, have wanted to do this and have thought that it would be OK mm. and have found themselves in situations where they just don't feel safe and have had to for their own mental health have had to had to withdraw. Yeah. And an artist has commented that the first time they were up and about being neurodivergent in an arts organisation, they received so much disability discrimination that they had to leave. And they're saying that that culture needs to change so that people feel safe. And I think, I think we'd all agree with that. David, I don't know whether you wanted to come in there. No, I, I was just going to say uh, it, it is a difficult thing. I mean, I've been disabled since I was 14. It's a difficult thing, but I, I personally decided I came from so many kind of oppressions of class and, and immigration and disability and poverty. I just thought I wrapped it all into a political campaign. I just decided when we're in the arts and the arts are supposed to be about the truth and you're supposed to be able to create a palette of truth in, in yourself and in your work. And I didn't want to live a kind of shadow life while trying to be a creative. So to me, I just, I, and it is difficult. You get a lot of trouble. You get stick, you get blank, you get no call back, you get all the usual rubbish. And so, but I just, and, and, as, and I joined the disability movement in the 80s and, and I, I just surrounded myself with, with colleagues and, you know, old school work comrades and people that just have supported it really. So I tried to find groups that supported me being visible basically, and then put, put that stuff into the work, put all mm. the frustrations into the content. Yeah, I'm coming back to an earlier question and the sort of, there's a sort of subtlety that, that we may have lost in the answers, but the sort of question you say, well, how do you deal with it if galleries have that expectation of you that they want it to be around disability impairment? I mean, a lot of us make work that's overtly and obviously about it. So, but I wonder if anybody wants to comment on that idea that how do we deal with it if galleries have an expectation that that's what it's about? Any offers? Well, I, I suppose, I mean, David was talking about that. It's, you you go on this journey, don't you? So when you're younger, you don't necessarily want to have some of these conversations because you're not entirely sure of all the issues around it. And I think once you have access to the social model of disability and other models, you feel a bit stronger. And when you connect with other disabled people that are experiencing the same things, you have a bit more strength and mm -hmm. I think that strength and that you know that that made me so excited by the fact I could I could be very honest and open about my impairment what that means how it works what that means I can or can't do it, it sort of lifted my confidence and made me be a bit more firmer with people and say I'm not doing that or I am doing that and this is what I want but it's very hard to get to that point because we're not I'll go back to that <laughs> education. It's not a natural thing that we're, we're doing in schools because you're still singled out in schools as a person of difference. And it's not a person of difference in a positive way, like within the you know, disability community, disabled people's movement. We'd say difference is really exciting. It's really valuable. It gives a completely different perspective and it makes it really interesting because it's that, you know, with your experience, you can have, you're a creative generator in a new way. And it's making sure that all that is, is understood and part and parcel of it. And even when I was talking about the Bartlett School of Architecture or any architecture school or any institution, um, I think Sonia referenced to it as well. If you can't be honest and open about something because the culture is so closed down and so discriminatory, 
you have to be really careful and we do need to crack these cultural institutions and other institutions for that not to be a heavy burden and something that you can't um you know it should be every day and it shouldn't be having these questions about it it should be there every day we can just get on and do our jobs uh within within certain flexibilities and different ways of doing things mm. there's a there's a I'm, I'm conscious we're four minutes away from the probably three minutes away from the end and there's a really interesting question from a, a, a sort of regional museum gallery service struggling to be more representative. And the sort of question is, do we bring, it's, it's kind of an old thorny question really, do we bring everybody with all the different impairments together, you know, and sort of have a, an impairment fest? Or, you know, how do we start to get more representative? Or do we start to pay disabled experts? And I mean, I'd always say, you know, disabled experts who understand cross impairment as well as social model approach to disability is more likely to give, that's the sort of thing that Richard might say if he was here. That's the way you really nail that and you bring people in when you need to bring people in. I don't know whether um, anybody's, I've always found that trying to bring, you know, a, a whole range of impairments in off the street doesn't necessarily get you closer to where you want to be, but maybe that's just my experience. I mean, I was just going to say from my experience of the work that I've been doing is the, the very end question is a starting point to get funds to pay for disabled experts is yes. You know, Davey talked about it. We've all talked about it in different ways, the idea of agency and actually getting out of the way and letting the people who know do the work alongside us you know uh, being being collaborative about it mm. um so for me that is absolutely fundamental is is getting the people in who have the lived experience work with the people mm. who have the lived experience and i guess for most of us we've got websites which say which which talk about you know our approach to being artists as well as our approach around disability so i think there's a lot more information out there for curators and galleries to start to think about uh, um to get them prepared for having those discussions, which we, we kind of hope might come in the future. Well, I suppose just very quickly, I think what's important is that when you are working with people is that the, the learning is passing on so that when that disabled expert does leave the organisation, if it's a time limited contract, that what is left behind is learning that can go on to be embedded more and more into the organisation. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a big question as well, isn't it? When I work with a large national institution and the person that drove, you know, the disability champion left and it all fell into to a great hole. I mean, it was just dreadful and some big mistakes were made uh, uh, following that. So it is that how do we keep that momentum going? And it, I think it does uh, stress the idea that having one champion isn't enough. You need to you need to have a a broader sense of uh, people both within the organisation and external to the organisation to be there constantly as advisors. I don't know wh whether uh, anybody... Can I just say, let us lead as well, Tony? Yes. Yeah, do you want to say more about that? Um, just I think disabled leadership is vital in this and the more disabled people you actually have at the top tables, the better it's going to be in terms of inclusion. And um, that's a very simple thing that could happen. Yes. Specifically, I think, and, and um, I think you could work with us, as, you know, as individuals, not necessarily uh, uh, people who uh, work within, but though, but build those uh, relationships long term rather mm. than, you know, just having maybe like a four year term or something like that. Yeah. Well, I get I get work by disabled artists on the walls. And get the you know get the statements up, get the conversations going, and that that's I think where uh, the starting point comes. For, personally, I've got to wind it up because um, somebody's knocking on my door and saying it's time to go home. So um, I, I'm sort of I'm looking at the clock. It's five o'clock. I'm going to draw us to a close, and we've run out of time. But I wanted to thank Leah for making the films, and I also wanted to to thank Ian and uh, Ash, who are working behind the scenes to make it all run so smoothly. And I want to thank all of you as well for being great contributors and for people for coming in and being part of the audience. And I'm sure these 
questions and answers can go on. I'm sure we're all, you know, we're all open to to be in it, to be in there to to answer questions if they come come at us. So, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoy the next two part, you know, the next two sessions that are coming. And uh, thank you all for being here. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.